Hi, I'm Jess Fields. Welcome to the show. The other day, I interviewed Representative Ilana Rebell from Idaho. She is the Democratic Minority Leader of the Idaho House of Representatives and the representative for District 18, which is basically the southeast side of Boise, the largest city in the state of Idaho. She responded to comments made by Republican Representative Heather Scott on a previous iteration of this program, as well as provided her own take on what kinds of measures are appropriate in the coronavirus age, talked a little bit about what her place and her caucus's place are in the uh, House of Representatives and in the legislature in Idaho, where Democrats are a substantial minority, and just gave us some, uh, some ideas on what she looks for ahead uh, with all this pandemic coming to a close and what her legislative agenda will be next legislative session. Uh, regardless of your view, I think you'll find this to be a very interesting interview with uh, Minority Leader Ilana Rebell from the Idaho House of Representatives. Joining me now is Representative Ilana Rebell. She represents District 18A in the Idaho House of Representatives since 2014 and is also the Minority Leader in the Idaho House of Representatives. Representative Rebell, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, my pleasure, Jess. So I just wanted to start out with a little bit of information about your district and what got you into the legislature. Could you explain a little bit about the area you represent and uh, your trajectory into uh, politics? Yeah, well, I've lived in my district for a long time, for, I don't know, 20 years or something, ever since we moved to Idaho. Um, I, uh, it's, it's a great district. It's, you know, got the most beautiful stretch of river path. Um, we have a lot with bright borders on Boise State. We have a lot of professors, a lot of students. Um, but we have a lot of people who work at the hospital, so a lot of doctors, nurses, and we also have micron um, technology. So we have a lot of engineers, and uh, we, it's, it's really a pretty wonderful place to be. Low crime, pretty good schools. So uh, Idaho is obviously uh, known as a, a fairly conservative state. Um, and I think the uh, House of Representatives has 70 members. Um, and then there's 14 Democrats. So uh, what is it like to be one of the few uh, Democrats in a majority Republican legislature? It is a challenge. Um, it's definitely difficult. Uh, you know, every everything is an uphill battle. Getting a hearing on bills, you know, getting anything to move forward, it's doable. You know, I'm not going to say it's impossible. Um, I've gotten, you know, as many significant pieces of legislation passed as anyone in there of any party, probably. But um, you know, you have to be kind of thoughtful about what you bring. You know, I'm certainly not going to be bringing you know, AOC type, you know, <laughs> or, you know, universal basic income or anything like that. Um, but, uh, you know, I, uh, I always make sure I have a Republican co-sponsor because um, you definitely, you know, you can't get anything passed on Democratic votes only. Um, I feel like I have to do a lot more thorough research and know my stuff inside out probably more than many Republicans. You know, I think there's a presumption when Republicans bring bills, they don't always get all their bills through either, um, but they sort of automatically have 80% on their side. So, you know, there has to be really a pretty good reason to stop their bills for them to not move forward. Um, whereas on, on my side, I feel like I have to spend months and months researching it six ways to Sunday and, you know, mobilize 20 different constituencies on the outside to come in and testify and write, you know, emails and letters and support for anything to move forward. Um, so it is a lot more work to get things to happen. But, uh, you yeah, know, I'm willing to do that work. And it's probably a good exercise for people in public office to go through that. So, um, you know, it, it is a challenge. Um, but I, I'm one, one that I think we rise to, I think my, my caucus is small but mighty. They're, they, they really work hard and take the job very seriously. So, Representative, it sounds like what you're saying is you have to work across the aisle more than maybe uh, Democrats in other states do. And <laughs> what, what uh, as far as we're going to get into more of the coronavirus topic, but obviously Governor Little uh, is at the center of that discussion. Um, what has been your relationship with the governor, who is a Republican, Brad Little? Yeah. Um, it's been it's been very good. I mean, I you know I've been I, I've been working with him largely since I got in six years ago. Well, before he became governor, because before that he was lieutenant governor. Um, we usually the the leadership team goes in and has meetings 
um, with the governor's team every other week. Um, and those are, you know, very pleasant meetings. They're always very friendly. They listen carefully to what we have to say and answer our questions. Um, you know, in, in some ways, you know, the Democratic caucus is probably more often supportive of the governor's agenda than his own party is. So I don't think he's, he's never, you know, typically does not see us as his, his problem. Um, and he's, you know, we have a great working relationship. Um, I was, you know, he, he signed all my bills, no issues with any, you know, vetoes or anything there, unlike his predecessor who did veto <laughs> so much. Um, so no, I've, I've had a good time working with, with Brad Little and I think his team is generally a bunch of smart, hardworking people. So obviously if you have 70 uh, house members, just doing basic math here and you have 14 <laughs> Democrats, then I guess it takes about what? 21, 22 Republican votes to, for you guys to, for your caucus to be able to advance something on your agenda? That's right. That's right. We'll have to get, yeah, exactly, pull in 22, at least 22 Republican votes, ideally more, although I have had bills pass on a 36, 34 vote. Um, it's a very scary nail-biting experience, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, absolutely, you know, working across the aisle is imperative. You know, there's no way you could accomplish a single thing unless you have good relationships that you work to cultivate. Um, I, you know, my first couple of years there, I made a point of every week trying to take at least, you know, at least one new Republican out to lunch. Um, and then I got so busy, I couldn't go out to lunch myself anymore. But uh, <laughs> that was, you know, it was a good exercise. And I think that, you know, we have a healthier inter-party relationship dynamic here than there appears to be in, at the federal level, at least, and probably in many other states. Interesting. So uh, obviously, uh, mm -hmm. now I, I do want to address, uh, uh, I guess, the, the elephant in the room, so to speak, this coronavirus issue is, you know, if somebody's watching in the future, we have a coronavirus pandemic going on now. It's kind of <laughs> occupying most of the news <clears throat> attention. Um, a little over a week ago, uh, I did a re an interview with Representative Heather Scott, who represents uh, District 1A in northern Idaho. And she made some comments that garnered a great deal of media attention and specifically referred to Governor Little as Little Hitler. Um, and I just was wondering if I could uh, have you comment on that and see what you had to say about that. Um, well, I guess, you know, from a personal perspective, I get, I get very frustrated by generally by, you know, comparisons in popular culture of, of people or events to, to Hitler and the Holocaust, um, which I feel is, I mean, I myself am Jewish. My, my grandfather's family was murdered in the Holocaust. Um, we came here and fled in 1941 um, to escape certain death. Um, and it was actually Holocaust Remembrance Week last week. We were here, you know, lighting a candle for a nine-year-old who perished in one of the concentration camps. Um, and so it does pain me every time, you know, here. And so obviously this isn't the first time. This is something that happens, unfortunately, all too commonly in popular culture where people, anytime something makes them mad or they feel as a government overreach, they compare it to Hitler or Nazis or whatever. And I, I just wish things would be taken down a notch on that because um, that was kind of a uniquely horrible episode in human history that's still pretty close to some of us in our memories and family histories. Um, and so I wish that people would stay away from that kind of rhetoric. How do you... But in terms of the substance of it, um, you know, I, I applaud, you know, Governor Little's approach to this thus far. Um, you know, he, I think, you know, he's been working very hard. It's been very painful decisions for him. He's, there is nobody in public office anywhere who wants to see, you know, such catastrophic damage done to their business community. I mean, it's, it's a nightmare. Nobody wants to see through the roof unemployment. Nobody wants to see businesses shut down and catastrophic loss of, you know, GDP and state revenues and all this. I mean, it's, it's kind of every public official's worst nightmare. Um, and nobody would do this for fun or take it lightly. I mean, I think, you know, this is unprecedented. I've never seen anything like this in my lifetime. Um, you know, I've, I've never seen it, at, you know, NBA shut down, NC, like everything in the world shut down. It's just un unprecedented to me. Um, but I feel like nobody would do that in, in bad faith in such a way. I think people would only do that if they genuinely felt it was really necessary to save lives. Um, and so, you know, I don't want to be second guessing that. You know, I have heard from some of the experts that are advising him. Um, we've heard from the state epidemiologists and the experts in the health and welfare department, people at the national level, state at every level. Um, and this is very much in line with the recommendations of the people who know the most about the situation. Um, and again, it was a very painful, politically difficult state, uh, stand for him to take. And I think he did it out of a genuine desire to protect against lives lost. 
So when I interviewed Representative Scott, she alluded to a large number of legislatures, uh, of legislators uh, in Idaho who actually agreed that uh, Governor Little's uh, coronavirus measures were an overreach or maybe were inappropriate. Uh, what does the, from your perspective as the House Minority Leader, what does the breakout of the legislature look like as regards Governor Little's uh, steps so far? And uh, just for our listeners and watchers, uh, he initially uh, put in place an order, I think in mid-March, uh, a stay-at-home order, and then just this last week, I believe, opted to extend it, correct? So where yep. does the legislature yep. come down on that? Well, I mean, that may be correct that, uh, you know, uh, I don't know if it's a major, I haven't polled the, you know, the legislature per se, but I, I'm, you know, I get emails, a lot of people were on an email exchange and firing their opinions back and forth. And there certainly did appear to be a, a good number of legislators who um, felt that it was inappropriate to do this stay home order and this shutdown order. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure that our legislature is necessarily 100% reflective of the desires of the people of Idaho. Um, you know, I think that there would be, they, there was actually an online poll that was put up by the Lieutenant Governor who was very critical of the governor's order, or just threw it out there and said, this order goes too far or what? And it was overwhelmingly supportive of the order in terms of the people out there. And for various reasons, I think, you know, in terms of the political dynamics of Idaho, I believe that our state legislature is many miles to the right of the actual people of Idaho. I mean, first of all, just in terms of partisanship, you know, when you look at statewide races, which is probably the best indicator, typically Republicans win. I'm not going to question that it's a, you know, heavily Republican leaning state, but most of them break out at about 60, 40. Um, so we can, you know, be pretty confident there's about 40% of Idahoans who consistently vote Democratic and we have 20% of the seats. So we're already, you know, there's already a skewing factor there in terms of, you know, there's 80, 20 Republican representation in the legislature, whereas it's only 60, 40 in the public at large. Um, but then beyond that, I think there's a further skewing factor because Idaho has close primaries. Um, and there are many parts of the state where there aren't even Democrats running. And so it's kind of whoever wins the primary is the person who's going to win. And only registered Republicans are allowed to vote in that primary. And primaries typically, as you know, I was a political science major back in the day, where primary typically tend to skew toward the more partisan ends. And that's true on both the Democratic and the Republican side, whereas, you know, more left-leaning people tend to vote in Democratic primaries than reflect the party as a whole, and more right-wing people vote in the Republican primaries than reflect the party as a whole. Um, so what you end up with is, you know, this the, the very most right-wing sliver of the Republican party are the ones who are choosing the people who end up in the legislature. So a lot of the time, the folks that end up in there are not necessarily, you know, reflecting the, the median of their, or the mean of their district. They're representing the choice of the most 20% right wing of the district, if you will. And um, so I think those factors combined um, lead to a situation where we have a legislature that skews far, far more right leaning than your average Joe on the street is. Um, and we saw that in the last election where we saw, you know, for example, Medicaid expansion Legislature had been blocking that for years, for seven years, they wouldn't even allow a vote on it. Um, and so you're at 80% of the legislature basically fighting Medicaid expansion tooth and nail. Then it gets on the ballot to the public at large and it passes by 61%. Um, so I thought that was a pretty stark illustration of that schism between you know, the political inclinations of the people and the political inclinations of the legislature. Uh, representative, your question there. <laughs> that's that's no. Thank you for for the details. So, representative, do you feel there are other factors beyond the primary process that influence the legislative tilt in the way that you describe? Um, I mean, I think it's mostly the primary process that does it. You know, I think we have some very aggressive. Well, there's also the you know the squeaky wheel phenomenon, right? So you have the primary, which is the selection process, um, and then you have certain constituencies, you know, within the right wing are very, very loud and very, very active. And they may not necessarily, you know, so you mentioned the Freedom Foundation before, they would probably be the primary example, um, but they are, you know, they're blogging all over the place. They're demonstrating and marching and, you know, staging all sorts of, they have a very active social media presence. Um, you know, I don't know that they particularly reflect a majority. I'd be very surprised if they did. And every poll that I've ever seen that's conducted of the populace at large, 
for, you know, on any issue almost, um, comes up with results that are totally not in alignment with the positions taken by the Freedom Foundation, but they are super loud and they will mock people and, you know, put out brazen insults and attacks. And so I think there's this fear, and that layers into the primary process, but people have this fear of, you know, antagonizing that group because they are a very loud minority who can make your life very difficult if you get on the wrong side of them. So you're, so you're referring, just so folks know, to the Idaho Freedom Foundation, which is one of the groups, uh, and we were having a conversation before about external groups to the legislature in the state of Idaho. What other organizations are there uh, that catch your attention as being part of that, uh, that side of things? Well, with respect to the coronavirus you know, lockdown situation per se, they're really the only group that I'm aware of that's this vocally opposing. In fact, it was interesting, before the order went into effect, um, there was a letter sent by a large number of local businesses and most of the restaurants here in Boise writing a letter to the governor asking him to shut down businesses and asking him to shut down restaurants. Um, and I haven't really heard, I mean, I, I have um, a, a constituent that I talk to a lot who owns a hotel in my district and who obviously has been hit horrendously hard on this. I mean, business just completely dropped off a cliff and I, I'm regularly talking to him about, you know, what can he do? How can he get the PPP loans? What, you know, he's in desperation. Um, but even he, you know, does not want to stay lifted too early. Um, even he is concerned about, you know, the public health impacts and that, you know, in a sense, I don't know that it'll necessarily be that beneficial for businesses to open if the public isn't comforted and enough to go patronize them, because then it's almost worse. Then they're paying all their employees. I mean, now at least they've laid off their employees and the employees are on unemployment, so they've been able to curtail their burn rate. Um, once they open up, then they're incurring all the burn rate of being open and ordering the food and paying all the bills. Um, but if customers aren't showing up, then you're actually worse off. Um, and so the business owners that I've talked to and a lot of the, the people in this area are not particularly clamoring to get things open. Um, I, I haven't heard anybody, honestly, outside of that Freedom Foundation network um, that's really particularly pushing against the governor's order right now. So, Representative, in your district, uh, which I think you said is southwest Ada County. Uh, uh, southeast. In, southeast. Southeast. I, I'm sorry, in Boise, correct? Uh, in, in Boise proper. So in your uh, district, are you, do you have a mix of opinions about this? Are people broadly supportive of the governor's order or is there a lot of skepticism or could you describe the mix uh, among uh, your own constituents? I, I've certainly heard, had some opposition. I've certainly had some, you know, received some emails saying, you know, open everything up right now. This is ridiculous. But that has been the minority of, of feedback. Um, overwhelmingly, people have seemed supportive. Certainly my neighbors, I found to be very supportive. Actually, it was interesting. A guy showed up at my house last Saturday, um, early morning. The poor gentleman, you know, had to see me in my pajamas. He got <laughs> a very nice man. Um, but he was there, uh, you know, basically he wanted to talk about ideas to thank the governor because he saw these marches against him and he was afraid that there was all this pressure coming against the governor from the other side. And he wanted to talk about ways to organize, you know, activate that silent majority, if you will, to send a more visible message of support support to the governor. Um, and he made a point of telling me that he was a Reagan Republican, um, that he'd been Republican, you know, this gentleman was probably in his 70s, that he'd basically been Republican his whole life, and that, you know, he was completely baffled as to why the right wing was turning against Brad Little on this. Um, so, you know, it's, I think that there are a large number of people on both sides of the aisle who support the governor's order right now. And it's some scary stuff, you know, you follow the news and you see what's happening to these people. And, you know, you see, 30, 40 year olds with no prior health conditions just dying a horrible death. You know, we're about to hit the same number of people that died in Vietnam, in the Vietnam War. I mean, we are likely to exceed the death rate. And, you know, these are not old, sickly people. These could be any of us. These could be kids. This could be, I mean, I think, you know, the people that are really following the, the more neutral news sources, if you will, are really genuinely afraid and are, you know, pretty okay with a few, you know, few weeks of inconvenience if it saves tens of thousands of lives. So, Representative, I want to go back to, uh, uh, I definitely want to return to the health implications of the coronavirus, but you mentioned marches and uh, the reports today that was a large, apparently a large protest uh, in front of the Idaho State Capitol. We're recording this on Friday. Um, uh, one article from Newsday cited approximately a thousand protesters. You know, these estimates, it's hard to know uh, how accurate, but they said about a thousand 
Um, why do you feel that people are uh, so strongly in opposition to this? And where do you feel like that opposition uh, really comes from? Um, well, yeah, it's, again, it's surprising to me. There's, you know, the, 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 certainly I think it's coming from, you know, these groups like the Idaho Freedom Foundation. I mean, the, you know, the, the, the legislators that have been leading that effort are the ones who are very, very tightly affiliated with the Idaho Freedom Foundation. I know that they have been overtly involved in, in a lot of this. Um, you know, I think they're sort of generally ideologically opposed to what they see as overreaching government action in all areas of life. I mean, they certainly... This isn't the first time they've spoken up on opposing any form of regulation or any form of anything. Um, so I think there's just a strong anti-government tilt and this has become a symbol of, you know, the, the governmental action they wish to oppose. But that, they, they oppose everything. I mean, I had a bill die on the floor this year that was for childcare regulations that, you know, basically said, you know, people working in daycare centers shouldn't be felons and they should have a fire escape plan in case of a fire. And if they're going to transport young children, they need to put them in seatbelts. And they went bananas on it and killed the bill because it was government action. Um, you know, So uh, I, I suppose they are consistent. They oppose every kind of government action. <laughs> so this is, this would fall in that category. Um, but again, you know, it's, I don't think it necessarily correlates with a more traditional vision of conservative values. I think this is just a unique part of, you know, the right wing movement. And I don't know that everybody in the conservative movement affiliates with that. Like my, my, like my Reagan Republican friend who showed up at my doorstep last week. Representative, so you, you feel like this is a, a smaller portion of the population and it's not a majority of Idahoans that feel this way. That's my sense. That's my sense. Now, you know, I mean, it, things can change if our as if our numbers drop, and if it gets to the point where we go, you know, weeks without any cases or any deaths or infections, then people might say, okay, this is too much pain to bear for what seems like a small threat. Although it's it's always a problem there because you know the reason the numbers may be low is probably because of the measures we're taking, right? It's like the old, you know, should you really throw away your umbrella in the middle of a rainstorm because you're not getting wet? Um, and that's, you know, the Y2K problem, right? Where they invested millions and millions in preparing for Y2K and they did it so well that nothing went wrong. And then everyone said, oh, how stupid you were wasting all that effort on Y2K. See, it was nothing. Well, the reason it was nothing is because so many people worked so hard to get ahead of it. Um, and so I think we need to, you know, walk a fine line in figuring out, you know, is it, is it really not a threat and therefore we don't need to respond? Or is the threat so minimal now because we are responding so well? So I think, go ahead. Well, so I was going to ask representative. So uh, obviously some immunologists are now saying that potentially this could be a long-term problem, that the coronavirus could recur in the fall or maybe even seasonally, similarly to the seasonal flu. And uh, a vaccine could be as long as a year or a year and a half away uh, some recent reports suggest that the coronavirus could be here through 2022 or even 2023. How long do you feel that ne measures similar to what are now being taken, uh, such as stay-at-home orders or requiring face masks, social distancing, how long is that appropriate? Uh, uh, given the oh, hang on a second. Honey, I'm on an interview. Can you please not make a lot of noise? Can you leave and now? Sorry. <laughs> let me let me re let me ask that same question again because I don't think I even asked it very well. I'll just cut this whole thing out. Um, um, so, Representative, um, obviously, some immunologists are now suggesting that the coronavirus situation could oh, take yeah. a long time to resolve, and in fact, some are saying that it could be a seasonal uh, matter where it comes back in the fall, maybe even worse than the first time. Some are also suggesting it could even go as long as 2022 or 2023, and a vaccine may be as long as a year or a year and a half away. We just uh, yeah. uh, heard the other day that Gilead's vaccine trial has not borne as much fruit as I think they had hoped. So we are perhaps a little ways away from solving this problem. How long do you feel it's reasonable to continue measures such as stay at home or uh, face mask mm -hmm. or social distancing requirements? Um, yeah, that's an interesting, I mean, I don't think the level that we're at right now is going to be sustainable for, you know, 
2021 or 2022. I think, you know, there are some things that I think people could live with more long term than others. Um, the whole, you know, never leaving your house at all and not, you know, being around anybody, I think is probably not sustainable for more than a very short term. <laughs> um, but some things, I mean, so representative wearing face masks to the store, that's not really a big deal. You know, a lot of people have been doing that in Asia for years, regardless of before there was any outbreak. Um, that's a pretty painless thing to do. I mean, I think there are some accommodations that people could probably handle more long term because they're minimally disruptive to daily living. Representative, um, you mentioned a, a shorter term that you feel like it would be sustainable for the present stay at home order that, that the governor has issued. What, what does that shorter term look like in terms of time frame? How long? Um, well, he's already said that it's going to be loosening up basically start, you know, after April 30th. So the current, you know, freeze, I don't anticipate going on much more than another week. Um, and I think we can handle that for another week. I mean, although you know, don't want to dismiss the economic pain. And, the, and there's a great deal of it with every day that people are going without revenue. And I worry a lot about the federal debt and things like that. I mean, this is um, frightening what it's going to do to our to our debt and other things long term. Um, but, uh, you know, I think I think our plan here is that things will be, you know, they'll be opening up all businesses, um, including the non-essential ones, um, but they will have to have some accommodations like do curbside service or require people to wear masks inside or things like that. Um, but, you know, having people wear masks isn't that big a deal. That's not a, that's not going to shut down your economy. You know, people can still basically go about their business with masks. Now, schools are a problem. That's a big problem. Um, they got to figure, I am not sold on this distance learning thing at all. Uh, I don't see it as remotely equivalent to kids being in a classroom with a teacher. Could you uh, describe to us what the situation in Idaho is with schools? Have they been closed for the whole semester or what is the... Yeah, they've, well, at least here, he, um, the, the governor left it up to each school district on what to do, but I think most of them have decided to basically shut down for the rest of the year um, and there's not much going on in school. I mean, there's, I don't know, there's sort of a token effort to do some Zoom things once a week. But um, I mean, it's, I don't think my kids are getting 5% of the education they should be getting right now um, if they were actually showing up for classes every day. Um, so it's, I think it's a really big setback. Um, it, maybe people can bounce back from a few months of lost education, but uh, I don't think they can bounce back from a year and a half of lost education. And I don't think we're at a level where online learning and remote learning is sufficient to get our kids educated. So representative, you mentioned that the governor's orders are, are obviously uh, maybe temporary, that, that there's a plan to reopen the state to some degree. Uh, but let's say that the state were to reopen after April 30th and then the number of cases began to rise again. Uh, what would be the action that you would suggest for Governor Little to take at that time? Um, well, I, I mean, yeah, I, well, I would always tell him to listen to his experts, which I am not one. Um, I just, you know, listen to the epidemiologists, listen to, you know, the, the guidance from the people who know, who know the most about this. Um, but at that point, my guess is it would probably be appropriate to step back up some protective measures if it turns out, as I said, that the reason we weren't getting wet is because we had an umbrella. And as soon as we threw out the umbrella, we got wet again. It might be an indication we should put up the umbrella again. <laughs> um, so yeah. if we, if, if, I hope if. That does not if, happen. Right. So if, if Idaho and other states, because obviously every state is experiencing some degree of pain from the coronavirus pandemic, but if there was a recurrence in the fall, that's perhaps a waning for the summer period, but then it comes back in the fall with force, as many uh, epidemiologists, immunologists are suggesting it will do, uh, at that time, is it going to be appropriate to reinstitute similar measures? Oh, well, okay, we got to take this, you know, one day at a time and see it's, you know, it's, uh, it's a pretty terrible situation we're in here right now. Um, you know, it's, it's, I have four kids, I'm immensely frustrated, they're not learning right now. Um, I'm, uh, you know, terribly worried about, I mean, our unemployment is through the roof, our businesses, I mean, businesses I worry are, you know, right now, I think they're on ice, and a lot of them are going to be able to kick back up if they can come back to life soon. Um, but after a few months, I think they're just going to be gone for good. I mean, I think it's going to be get get you know get to the point where they can't be resuscitated after a certain number of months, and that's going to be a much bigger long-term hit. Um, but on the other hand, dead people really can't be brought back to life. Um, so. Uh, I am just really, uh, you know, I think we're, you know, in the long term, I think we're probably going to have to find more flexible control measures, you know, maybe involving masks and people sitting with their seats further apart, or I, I don't know what, I think there, 
maybe going to have to find more creative ways that let us go about some measure of daily business without breathing on each other. Um, but, uh, you know, again, I, I will wait to see what the experts say when the time comes. But, uh, and boy, we need a therapeutic or a vaccine like yesterday. This is terrible. So to ask you the same question I asked uh, your colleague, Representative Scott, if I made you governor for the day um, uh, and you could do whatever it was to uh, maybe support businesses, as you're suggesting, or to implement safety measures, what would your ideal policy look like, uh, Representative? Um, you know, well, I guess I would probably roll back the clock a little bit because I feel like, um, you know, the, our, our legislature kind of dropped the ball during session and really didn't do anything about, I mean, we saw this coming, like the coronavirus was exploding while we were still in session. Um, and there were a lot of things we should have been working on, like how are we going to make sure our schools have the ability to do online learning? What does that, you know, what can we do to boost broadband? When, when did that session end, Representative? Well, it ended March 20th, so March we were 20th. already okay. into, you know, the, the president's statement that nobody should be collecting or gathering groups of over 10. I mean, basically, the stay-home order was pretty much in effect by then, and the legislature was still meeting, but it was not at all to address anything useful. I mean, there were really things that needed to be done, like figuring out, you know, our broadband situation is terrible here, so if the world is really going to be moving into Zoom meetings and online this and that, you know, it's not a good situation that half the state doesn't have internet access. Like that should have been the kind of emergency stuff we were working on. You know, what are schools gonna need to be able to keep up learning? Going? Because right now there's nothing, <laughs> you know, our kids are just not learning. It was like school just came to a screeching halt um, because nobody was prepared. There was no plan. There was no infrastructure to actually have this online thing be in any way productive. So the schools basically went a month, just completely checked out. Um, and then they sort of tried this half-assed, I want to, well, <laughs> bad language, but, um, <laughs> you know, kind of, well, let's try an hour a week online for whoever has internet and can tune in. But, you know, that's not school. Um, and I think there should have been really aggressive measures taken to figure that out. Make sure, you know, the governor's been talking to us every week, but they were out of nowhere, all these unemployment claims, you know, they were, they were set up to process, you know, maybe 50 calls a day or something. And now they're getting, you know, 3000 calls a day and they're totally unequipped to be handling this. Um, so, you know, they're doing the best they can, given that they're doing this mad scramble with no preparation. You know, I can't criticize what they're doing under the circumstances, but you know, we kind of saw this coming more, you know, a month and a half ago while the legislature was still in session and they had no interest in figuring out, you know, how to address the coming unemployment crisis, you know, how to make sure our medical facilities were up to speed to take the influx. What can we do about the education? Like none of that. How can we boost broadband so that the majority of Idahoans can actually meaningfully participate in life online? I mean, they were just sitting there just doing one crazy social issue thing after another. They were there, you know, they did a prospective abortion ban in case Roe v. Wade is ever overturned. They banned transgender athletes. They banned affirmative action. Like they did all these, you know, kind of right-wing social agenda wish list and just like la 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 for anything that might have actually been useful for the coronavirus crisis. Um, so, but in terms of where we are right now, I think they're, you know, they're doing a decent job. They're really trying to ramp up their abilities, training more people like mad to try to answer all the unemployment calls. One thing I think they could do that would be really helpful is helping businesses navigate um, the, the, the funds that they can apply for federally um, because there's really no help for that. And these small businesses are really struggling on figuring out how to work the system. All the money ran out basically within two days. I mean, the entire PPP fund was gone within the first week. And so now all these businesses are like, I finally figured out how to apply and now they're telling me all the money's gone. Um, and I'll be really interested to see who got the money and who was at the front of the line because it does not seem like it was, you know, maybe that money was not making the unconnected small businesses of the world, let's just say. <laughs> Representative, would you, uh, would you say that the, uh, the money, uh, you say unconnected small businesses maybe didn't receive the funds. Are, are you suggesting that the stimulus funds uh, is what you're talking about from the, the $2 trillion stimulus bill that the, the federal government passed? Uh, the stimulus funds were maybe doled out in a political fashion. Well, of course, I have that fear. Um, and frankly, I would have felt a lot better if there were an inspector general overseeing it and making sure there was no funny business. But the president decided to fire the inspector general before any of the money could go out the door. Um, so that, you know, heightens my concern further because it seems 
awfully odd that, you know, a trillion dollars flew out the door and it's all gone before my little businesses in my district could get in line for it. And the president fired the watchdog um, who should have been in place to make sure that the funds were being distributed fairly. Um, and, you know, one always wonders, why would you fire the watchdog if it's all going to be done in a perfectly, you know, fair uh, manner that would hold up to the light of day? I mean, that doesn't seem like an innocent action to just, you know, eliminate all oversight uh, coming out of the gates. Um, now, you know, I hope I'm not right on that, but it's sure, um, I am concerned and I would like, somebody to do some real digging in there and figure out who got the money and what their metrics were and what the rationale was for who got the money first um, and make sure that this was not done in some sort of, you know, rewarding buddies kind of way. Do you feel there's a need for additional federal action to support businesses such as the ones you mentioned maybe didn't receive the funding in your district? I mean, yes, probably, but I'm, you know, I would like to know that there's a better framework in place to police against, you know, graft and corruption before we pour more money into the drain. But um, time really is of the essence for these folks, and they, they do need the money very, very quickly. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I just want to see some really aggressive oversight because there's almost infinite potential for corruption in, in, in a system such as this, where you just have wild amounts of money being given away on an incredibly short-term basis <laughs> and and as i said it's not everybody's getting that money you know, pretty much all the small businesses i talk to in my business in my district are not getting that money they did what they were supposed to do they showed up and they were just told like oh sorry money's all gone um and it makes you wonder Representative, I want to pivot back a little bit to something that was mentioned by Representative Scott, as well as has been covered on its own as an issue in recent days in several national news articles. And that is the notion that local sheriffs have the ability to resist federal and state laws uh, regarding coronavirus or maybe other things as well. Um, Representative Scott indicated that at least one of the sheriffs in her district, I believe it was in Bonner, County had the ability to uh, resist those state orders and not enforce uh, the governor's orders. What is your perspective on that? Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. You know, I try to be an intellectually consistent person, <laughs> and um, you know, I, I I certainly have been one to champion acts of civil disobedience at various points in history. You know. Um, and, you know, I am a believer that, you know, unjust laws should be disobeyed. Um, I don't see this as an unjust law, you know, I've, but I can see how views might differ. Uh, you know, certainly, do I think people should have disobeyed the segregation laws in the South? Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, I don't see this as one of those laws <laughs> at all. I mean, this, you know, what the governor is doing right now seems in no way on par with anything like that, where to me, it would not feel morally justifiable to defy, you know, laws in that manner when what we're talking about is a, you know, short-term public safety thing that's not motivated by, you know, racism or tyranny or anything like that. It's just a short-term genuine effort to try to save lives. And so to me, that feels like a misguided application of the principle of, uh, of civil disobedience. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I wouldn't want to make a blanket statement that civil disobedience is never appropriate. I think there are probably times when it is. I just... Uh, would very much disagree with their assessment that this is such a time. <laughs> well, Representative, maybe I'll reframe the, the question, um, because obviously in civil disobedience, I think there's a general concept of uh, uh, regular people who are not in a position of authority, disobeying right. laws that they uh, feel are unjust or immoral. Um, in the specific case with regards to Northern Idaho, and I don't know, perhaps other counties in Idaho, but also maybe other counties in the nation, uh, you have local officials who believe that they do not have to enforce laws from the state and federal level that they disagree with for whatever reason. Right. Um, so, and I think specifically, uh, she had mentioned Sheriff Daryl Wheeler in Bonner County, and he has been in other news articles also cited uh, as being a constitutional sheriff. And then there is an organization of constitutional sheriffs. Uh, what is your perspective on this, and do you feel that local officials have uh, the right to resist uh, orders from the governor or from the federal government? 
Well, I mean, I think they took an oath that they would uphold these laws and, um, and you know, that they would uphold the law of the state of Idaho, which this clearly is. So, you know, as a legal matter, I, I can't imagine that they're actually, you know, living up to what they swore to do in their oath. Um, so, uh, again, I, I, haven't, I haven't solicited an attorney general opinion and it's outside my own area of law, but I'm pretty sure that they swore to uphold the law and that they can't just decide not to now. I think as a legal matter, that's what they're supposed to do. Um, and again, as a now again, I'm I'm a big civil libertarian. I'm a, you know, <laughs> I'm a big advocate of the Bill of Rights and all these things. Now I guess you know, putting it in those terms of you know, let's say it were 19 you know 56, and a sheriff is ordered to arrest a bunch of black kids at the at the soda counter in an all white restaurant. You know, would I like to see that sheriff defy? The law, yes, I would actually, even though they are an officer of the law. Um, you know, I mean, there are some laws that are so morally wrong that even if you're an officer of the law, now maybe you're not acting legally, maybe you go to jail for doing this, maybe you're violating the law. Um, but as a moral principle, I think there are times when even as a law, as, as an officer of the law, you know, there maybe is an appropriate time and place to, to disobey the law. I do not think this is that time or place. Um, I don't see any of the underpinnings. I think it would have to be a really seriously compelling moral imperative um, that would drive that. And uh, in no way, shape, or form do I think the scenario we're dealing with right now could justify that kind of defiance on the part of an officer that has taken an oath, I believe, to uphold the law. In some states, such as in California, uh, there has been uh, an invocation of the National Guard to enforce state orders. I asked Representative Scott about that and what would happen if the governor invoked the National Guard and the word that she used was trouble. Um, do you feel it would be appropriate under any circumstance for the governor of Idaho to invoke the National Guard to enforce coronavirus regulations? Well, I mean, I feel it would probably be within the bounds of his emergency powers, which are pretty extensive. Um, so as a legal matter, I think he would be within his rights if it, you know, I think it would have to be a very, very extreme scenario for that to happen. Um, and, you know, I, I don't think that the levels of, you know, small scale disobedience we're seeing right now would justify the intervention of the National Guard. And I don't think the governor has any interest in going down that path because, you know, there's the what's technically legal question. And then there's the what's a smart thing to do and you know reasonable thing to do um and to some extent i feel like every act of enforcement almost is more oxygen for the movement for the protest movement right i mean every time some step is taken however perfectly legal and really even reasonable it might be it just really fans the flames and gets thousands more people out holding more protests and exposing more children to you know com compact i mean because these people take kids to this stuff and they're not wearing masks and they're not standing six feet apart um you know i mean it's kind of the you know these these protests are in themselves kind of a public health hazard um and every act of of um enforcement you know triggers a new more aggressive round of protest and defiance um and so i think you know probably it wouldn't be a very politically smart move just because it would be giving so much more oxygen oxygen to the movement that's fighting against him if he did that. And right now, I think we're getting pretty high levels of compliance without having to take particularly heavy-handed enforcement. Um, so, you know, unless there were really some kind of crazy hell breaking loose, you know, I would certainly advise him not to go down the path of using the National Guard. So uh, I want to back out a little bit of the coronavirus situation, uh, but I guess as a, a final matter on that point, is there anything that you feel uh, people should be aware of or any particular uh, measure that you would encourage people, say your own constituents, to take to avert the present crisis or just give them a little encouragement during coronavirus? Do you think we will emerge from this or are you maybe a little bit more skeptical of it? Oh, I mean, we will emerge from this unquestionably. I mean, you know, we we emerged from the Civil War, we emerged from Vietnam, we emerged from World War II, and I mean, we emerged from the Spanish flu of 1918. Um, you know, we emerged from the Great Depression. Um, you know, we've overcome much bigger problems than this. 
um, you know, maybe we've gone soft because it's been a number of decades since we had that kind of an epic catastrophe hit our civilization. <laughs> that for most of us, we haven't seen, you know, the big, crazy, you know, society shattering things have happened in America pulled through, but none of them were in our lifetime. So for you and I, this feels like kind of an end of the world scenario. But I think, you know, when you look at it from the bigger picture of history, you know, compared to something like, you know, World War II or even this, I mean, this is a fairly small blip and it feels like the end of the world to us to, you know, go a month without being able to go to the hairdresser. Um, but I think for people who lived through the Civil War, they would kind of scoff at us and say that we're, we're ridiculously soft, for, you know. <laughs> um, so it's, but, but, you know, but still it's a real hardship. I mean, people are being driven into homelessness and poverty. People are dying. Tens of thousands of people are dying. So it's, it's not trivial at all. It's a very, very serious, and the most serious thing we've encountered in our lives, most of us who are alive right now. Um, but uh, no question we can overcome this. Um, and we will be, you know, I'm sure in five years, you know, everything will be recovered. I'm sure in five years, you know, the Dow will be back to where it was and people will be back in homes and employment will be at a good level again. And, you know, generally things will be solidly back on track. Well, Representative, for people maybe who are watching this years hence, um, if you go back to the very first uh, of these shows that I did and my hair was quite a bit shorter, you can watch my hair getting longer <laughs> and longer uh, through each episode so that the <laughs> barber shops uh, I am waiting uh, to open uh, uh, oh, yes. with anticipation. Um, if I can uh, uh, pivot away from coronavirus and just ask you, as the minority leader of uh, Democrats in the Iowa, uh, I'm sorry, Idaho House, um, uh, what are the main issues that you feel are facing the state of Idaho in the next couple of years? Yeah, great question. I mean, you know, if, if you're right, because we had, we certainly had a full slate of things to deal with before this hit, and now it feels like everything got shoved to the back burner, but there, you know, we still had some pretty real issues facing us. Um, I mean, Idaho, you know, it's, um, it, it's always, some people refer to it as a scroll down state in terms of, you know, when you look at lists of things, you often have to reach to the bottom to find, and, and it's all on things you don't want to be on the bottom of. I mean, things on, you know, percentage of kids that go on to post-secondary education, income per capita, and, you know, education levels per capita, pay, teacher pay, um, air quality. Uh, like there are a lot of these lists um, where, you know, you find us at the bottom, you know, by Mississippi and Alabama. Um, and that's not where I'd like us to be, you know, so I think, you know, we need to really aggressively delve into how we can move Idaho on up those lists and be leaders in income per capita and quality of life and, and you know, all these things, and, you know, access to education. Um, so those are really persistent problems that we have that, you know, big long-term problems that will outlast the coronavirus crisis that we need to wrestle with. Um, and uh, that's, those are the things I think we should be working very hard to wrap our head around once we survive this. But unfortunately, they all interconnect because our state revenues are going to be in the toilet from this. Um, you know, we are just going to have no money. <laughs> and unfortunately, many of those things require money. Um, so it's really hard to, you know, fix, for example, low teacher pay. I mean, we have a terrible problem with teacher recruitment and retention because we pay so much less than any state around us that teachers don't want to come here and teach here. Um, and I don't know how you fix that when you have no money um, and when our state revenues just you know, dive. Um, so I think this complicates you know, an already challenging um, situation that we were facing to fix our more endemic, broader background problems. So for the next uh, legislative session, um, what would be the top two or three priorities that you would try to urge for the Democratic caucus in uh, the Idaho House? Um, well, I mean, we're, we're, we're always pretty consistent on trying to push, you know, the values of kind of Im improving daily life. Um, so I think, you know, what, again, it all has to be pretty flexible given what the state of our revenues are um, and what can be done. Um, and it's, uh, you know, I, I think we might need to look at more creative sources of revenue. And like, for example, one of the things, Idaho collects um, internet sales tax, but we're not allowed to use it. So they put this special lockbox on our internet sales tax. So regular sales tax, like when you go to a brick and mortar store, that's used for, you know, the general fund and paying teachers and education and healthcare and all that stuff, um, and roads and you name it. But if you buy something on the internet, that's locked away in a separate box that can only be used for tax reduction. 
Now, we were already in a situation where internet sales tax was eating, where internet sales were eating up brick and mortar sales. I mean, even before coronavirus and the stay home and all that, we were still deterioration in brick and mortar sales and everything migrating to the internet. And now, of course, we're going to have months of no sales and 100% internet sales. Um, so we're basically going to have this giant, you know, we're just losing this major desperately needed source of revenue that is all migrating over to this untouchable lockbox. So that's the kind of thing that I think we're going to be pushing for to say, be like, look, you know, we really can't afford this. I know it may be bread and circuses and it might make people really happy in an election year to say like, I'm just here to cut your taxes. But at some point they're going to want teachers and roads and stuff too. Um, and uh, I don't think we can afford to have, you know, the only growing pot of revenue in the state be completely out of reach for basic needs. So we'll be looking at that and kind of how to find, you know, ways to meet the state's basic needs in the most painless way possible. And in a way that doesn't land on the shoulders of the people who can least afford to pay. So there's a, a basically all internet receipts are going into a fund that you can't access to use for anything else in the state. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's very odd. <laughs> so uh, that's, I don't know how long that can last. I mean, so we're certainly going to be pushing to open that lockbox um, because given the revenue crisis we're facing, um, there's only so much you can do with tightening belts and our belts are pretty darn tight. Our belts are so tight we can't keep teachers working in the state. Um, and I'm not sure cutting back on funding further is going to yield the results that voters are going to be happy with. So I think looking forward, uh, Representative, um, I, I guess I'd be curious as a uh, part of the leadership of the legislature um, and you look at the landscape uh, right now with, um, uh, if I may say, some division and some very strong opinions on, on, on both sides and so forth. Uh, what would you say to people maybe of a different opinion or uh, what would be your general message going forward about uh, how to bring those different opinions to the table, how you'd want to work with them uh, or, uh, or, or what have you? What, what's your perspective on that? The situation that you have in Idaho, but also really is a national situation with so many different strong opinions on the ta on the uh, coming to the table. Oh yeah, well, I mean, I, I I always hope that something like this would 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 galvanize a move away from rigid partisan divide. Um, <clears throat> that pretty much, you know, we should all be united in a desire to you know, get sick people treatment, minimize the number of people getting sick, um, and, you know, get our economy back on track, get people back to their jobs, you know, as quickly and with as little damage as possible. And, and you would think that that's something that should transcend ideological and partisan barriers. Um, and so I guess I would urge everybody to kind of keep their eye on that prize and try to not go down the rabbit holes of, you know, these bizarre, I, I don't understand where partisan affiliation comes into this. I'm honestly kind of mystified that this has become this weird partisan, you know, oh, you know, Democrats want lockdowns and Republicans want to open everything up or that, you know, it's, it's really strange to me. I'm not sure why partisanship would come into this or why any, anybody should be looking at anything, but how can we keep the most number of people healthy and get our economy recovering as quickly as possible. So um, I'm always hoping that that will be the move we move toward and just, you know, try to work together and find by, you know, common sense solutions. But unfortunately, this crisis, like everything else, seems to be devolving into kind of a oppositional defiance <laughs> and uh, just a total party breakdown. Representative, as we move towards the end here, and thank you for your time, uh, I want to ask you to hold the crystal ball for a second and answer the question that probably everyone is wondering. When will Boise State football win a national championship? <laughs> well, uh, we had a little bit of a setback here with there being no footballs <laughs> happening. Uh, you know, we've, we've got an amazing team, and I think next year, I'm just going to go on. There you go, next year, next year. <laughs> I think the field is blue, isn't it, the Boise State field? Yes, it, yes, it is. And, uh, it's, and Boise State's a great school. And I hope that they can, I mean, they're taking really tough cuts. We just had an article in the paper here about how they're furloughing everybody and it's, uh, it's not going to be good. But at least 
we're all on equal footing there. I'm sure every university across the country is in the same boat. So it's not like we're competitively falling behind anybody else. Um, but we have a great program and you will never find more devout fans than here in the city of Boise. On game day, you cannot walk into a store or supermarket anywhere in town without seeing everybody there wearing BSU attire. Well, if I may, uh, I think if you go to College Station, my alma mater, Texas A&M, would, would disagree <laughs> with that. But, uh, uh, but certainly very devout fans and a lot of fun to watch uh, Boise State. Uh, and also, yes, a great university. A representative, as we close out, uh, Leader Rebel, uh, Minority Leader uh, of the uh, Idaho House of Representatives. What would you just in general comments you might have for folks that are watching this, listening, uh, your constituents, uh, other citizens of Idaho and, and folks around the country? Oh, goodness. Well, I, I guess I just would, would put out there that, you know, I, I hope they have some faith and confidence that their elected leaders um, truly have their best interests at heart. Um, you know, nobody does this job to be a jerk. You know, here in the Idaho legislature, it pays $17,000 a year. Um, and there is no glory. Uh, nobody, you know, <laughs> there's no fame. There's no glory. We get, you know, like a free box of dried hash browns, you know, a couple times a year is our big perk. Uh, Wait a minute. Do you, do you really get a, a box of dried hash browns? We do. We do. Those are one of the perks of office. But, uh, you know, nobody is doing this to be rich and famous. You know, nobody is doing this out of any desire other than, you know, really, really to try to make your community a better place. Um, and we're really brainstorming in some pretty uncharted territory. You know, as I said, nothing like this has ever happened in any of our lifetimes. So we're all scrambling to get the best information and make the best decisions on the fly that we can with the information that we're given. So I would urge everybody, you know, not to get too angry, um, not to ascribe bad motives. Um, that you know, I know it's 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 really painful and people hate being shut down, but. Um, you know, there are really smart experts who can, you know, they may not be right either, but the best we can do is try to listen to them because, you know, they're, they're the ones who seem to know the most and who really study this. So we're doing the best we can and, you know, ha have, a, have as much confidence as you can that your elected officials got into this job because they want to help people and that's what we are trying to do. Minority Leader Ilana Rebell, representing District 18A in the Idaho House of Representatives, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Jess. This was a lot of fun. And that was Idaho House Minority Leader Ilana Rebell. If you like this program, please remember to subscribe on YouTube or in your favorite podcast app. If you have an idea for a guest, email me, jessfieldshow at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.